Thank you very much. Uh, this has been a, a wonderful day so far, and I'm really grateful for this opportunity to come back to Aachen to visit again. I was in this same room, uh, as Nicole uh, reminded me. Um, it was, must have been seven years ago, I, I think it was. There was, there was the, the first conference. And uh, it's a great pleasure to come back and reconnect with old friends and colleagues and meet new ones. It's also a tremendous honor to be giving a lecture in this Charlemagne Distinguished Lecture Series with so many illustrious uh, names that have come before me. So um, what I'd like to do today is share with you some of the work our group has been doing in modeling of ice sheets, in particular the Antarctic ice sheet. Uh, the general philosophy is that of Bayesian inference. So how do we merge data and models? How do we learn models from data? Uh, this is definitely not machine learning, although I could probably call it machine learning because everything fits under that rubric today. Uh, but this is using physics-based models. So we interpret the data through the lens of a physics model. We make inferences about the model, again, through, through the physics model itself. The methodologies are equally applicable to machine learning problems, and so there's much in common there, but the, the philosophy of how one goes about doing it is quite different. Uh, so, uh, so that's the, the basic idea. How do we, how do we learn from data uh, observations of the Antarctic ice sheet flow to understand the basal processes that are happening at the base of the ice sheet? I'll start off by saying a little bit about the problem itself, then I'll go into the methodology which we've applied to numerous problems, and then I'll come back to the Bayesian ice sheet problem. Before I start, let me mention this is joint work with some former group members. Toby Isaac was a PhD student in our program. He's now assistant professor at Georgia Tech in the Computational Science and Engineering uh, School, actually. They call it a school of computational science and engineering. Uh, Noemi Petra was the postdoc and is now an assistant professor at University of California, Merced, in the mathematics department, and Georg Stadler, also former postdoc and research scientist, who is now an associate professor at Quran Institute at NYU. Okay, uh, so let me start off by saying uh, a few words about the, uh, okay, here we go. Uh, so a few words about inverse problems, and um, to do that, Okay, I think maybe the battery is weak. That's fine. I can just advance. Nah, I'll just advance the slides from here. So uh, a few words about inverse problems and the different philosophies between the Bayesian approach and the classical approach. So this is meant to illustrate an inverse problem. We have uh, cubes of meat coming in here, going through a grinder, and out comes the ground meat. So this is you know, a cartoonish representation of input parameters into a model. Uh, this is the outputs of the model, and the model itself is the body of the meat grinder. And of course, solving the model is what? It's turning the crank, that's solving the model. Okay, so the forward problem, uh, the usual setting, we specify model parameters, and, and model parameters here, I'm, I'm speaking in, in the abstract. This could be initial conditions, boundary conditions, you know, source terms, coefficients, material properties, and even geometry. All right, so M represents any or all of that. And the forward problem is specifying model parameters, solving the model, and outputting the observables D. So in the Antarctic ice sheet, these will be parameters that represent the friction at the base of the ice, which we don't know, is, is an unknown quantity. The grinder would be the ice flow equations. We'll get to those, but it's essentially it's a creeping, viscous, and compressible uh, flow. And the outputs are the surface velocities that we observe by satellite, okay? So the forward problem typically is well posed. Um, but the inverse problem, so well posed, we have existence, uniqueness, uh, and continuous dependence on the data. The inverse problem, on the other hand, takes observations of the outputs and tries to reconstruct the inputs by going backwards through the equation. And so, you know, abstractly, this is represented like this. We, we don't actually invert the forward operator. We'll talk about what we actually do in a minute. Uh, but the important thing is inverse problems are typically ill-posed. Uh, we typically don't have uniqueness, and we definitely don't have stability in, in the usual setting. It's a very rare situation in which we have those. Uh, so how do we go about 
tackling this ill-posedness? Well, there's the classical approach that dates to Tikhonov, you know, 1940s and 50s. Uh, and what this amounts to is employing regularization to penalize unwanted solution features and thus guaranteeing a unique solution. So we say we seek model parameters M uh, that make the data misfit uh, as small as possible. Okay? Uh, and this can be weighted in a certain way. Uh, so the difference between the, the model output and what we observe of the observables, okay? we're trying to minimize this, but we add an extra penalty term that attempts to annihilate the null space, effectively null space, of the operator associated with this term, essentially the Hessian operator, the second derivative operator of this term. Uh, so this, this is a regularization term, as we said. R is a regularization operator. And again, we're trying to eliminate uh, unwanted solution features, those essentially that are not observable from the data. So this might impose uh, smoothness. If this is L2 norm, it imposes a bound on the, on the magnitude. If it's H1 norm, it imposes um, a bound on the gradients. Uh, it could be the TV regularization, total variation regularization, which imposes sparsity on the gradient. Okay, but that's the general idea. The Bayesian approach says, now hold on, we don't want just a unique solution. There's information contained in a family of solutions. So what we're looking for is a probability density. So we're looking for the distribution of the parameters given the data. And in a special case, which is actually very common, of Gaussian additive noise, so where the noise is, is, um, is uh, considered to be distributed as a Gaussian, uh, that amounts to representing or exploring a posterior distribution that has uh, this form. Now this looks a bit like it could be a Gaussian, but it's not because the parameter to observable map, M to F, is nonlinear in general. It's not linear. If this were linear, then you would have a Gaussian, uh, but this is nonlinear in general. So uh, we have a posterior distribution which is in general non-Gaussian, even if the prior is Gaussian. But this, it takes this general form and it says, well, the probability of the model given the data, it, it increases whenever the model predicts the data and whenever the model parameters are uh, close to, in, in a certain sense, uh, to some mean, some, some prior mean. Uh, and so this represents prior knowledge, okay? So we can see immediately a parallel between these two. Uh, the prior plays the role of the regularization. If we actually look for the point that maximizes the posterior probability, well, then this is equivalent to minimizing the negative log of the argument, and then that leads us back into this, this setting. So there is actually quite, quite a parallel between these two, and in fact, our whole philosophy is to try to exploit fast methods for solving this problem, to try to exploit them to accelerate common Markov chain Monte Carlo methods for, for sampling the posterior. And I'll say more about that. All right, so that's the basic idea. Uh, so let's talk a little bit about the uh, driving problem. We've applied this also to earthquake seismology, to mantle convection, to subsurface flows, um, pore elasticity, a number of problems arising in the geosciences. But I've chosen this one to speak about, so let's talk a little bit about Antarctica. Uh, as you know, you know, ice flows, uh, ice acts on long time scales like a viscous fluid, it's a highly viscous fluid, viscosity of 10 to the, you know, 10 to the 12th, 10 to the 15th Pascal seconds. Uh, and the, uh, in Antarctica, the flow is driven by gravity because you have thicker ice in the interior and it flows out to the ocean. Uh, when ice flows off of land and onto the ocean, it's known as an ice sheet. This, uh, the ice can break off. Uh, what has been observed over the last several decades is that the ice has been thinning uh, in, in many parts of Antarctica, especially in West Antarctica. So ice has been thinning uh, and the flow rates have been accelerating. And of course, the delivery of ice, the mass flux into the ocean, is the critical thing that drives sea level rise. Floating ice, sea ice, when it melts, of course it doesn't raise sea level, uh, but it's land, uh, land ice that gets into the ocean, primarily from the ice sheets, Greenland and Antarctica, but also the mountain glaciers in, in the Andes, Alaska, and um, Himalaya, and uh, the Alps. Uh, but there are 60 meters of sea level rise tied up, potential sea level rise, tied up in the Antarctic ice sheet. Okay, uh, So that's quite a bit. Of course, it's not going to collapse overnight. 
Uh, but there have been periods in Earth's history where th there has been a rapid increase in sea level, which can only be explained by collapse of a portion of the ice sheet. So uh, gravity is driving the ice flow. What has been observed is the oceans have been warming over the last several decades. Uh, that's likely due to an in increasing intensity of the circumpolar winds, which have created more mixing in the oceans, which have delivered warmer water to the base of the ice sheet uh, and the ice shelves, leading to a retreat of the ice inland and, and um, collapsing of these uh, shelves. The shelves play a buttressing role. They keep ice from flowing off of land. They help keep it from flowing off of land. So as these shelves collapse, that leads to greater flows. I mean, this is the, this is the, the, the current theory. So um, this summarizes uh, what I've said and gives a few numbers. Currently about 200 billion tons per year of polar ice sheet, that's Greenland plus Antarctica, uh, is flowing into the ice, uh, is flowing into the ocean. Uh, and you know, as I said, the observation, there, there you know, plenty of observations uh, from satellites and, and, and airborne uh, geophysical surveys uh, that the flow rates have been increasing. Uh, the uh, a half a meter sea level rise by the year 2070, which is actually considered a, a, a somewhat you know, reasonable, uh, it used to be kind of an upper bound, now it's more uh, of a, a median or even a lower bound. Um, by the year 2070 is estimated to jeopardize 136 largest port cities with 150 million inhabitants and 35 trillion in assets. So we need models, we need predictive models. But because there are large uncertainties in these models, we have to have quantified uncertainties in them to anticipate future sea level rise. Uh, and then, as I mentioned a few minutes ago, uh, there, you know, this is not new. This has happened in Earth's history. At the, at the end of the last interglacial period, so just before uh, the start of the last ice age, about 118,000 years ago, when uh, temperatures were um, at, at, a, at a maximum, uh, there is evidence that there was a five to six meter abrupt rise in sea level. Now abrupt means anywhere from a few hundred years to a few, to maybe a thousand years. This comes from fossilized coral found at, at these heights uh, that is then dated. And so this is within, you know, within the resolution of the dating. Um, it's something around 118,000 years ago. But this is rapid on geological time scales. And the only explanation for this uh, has to be from a collapse of uh, a portion of the Antarctic ice sheet, you know, most likely the western, uh, western part of the ice sheet. Uh, and uh, this is, so this is something that could happen today. Uh, now, I need to um, escape for a second to allow, uh, all right, this should do it. Okay, um, here we go. So this is an animation of ice flow. This is actually not a numerical simulation. This is satellite data. So interferometric synthetic aperture radar. What you're seeing here are uh, streamlines. The warmer colors represent flow velocities of the order of kilometers per year, several kilometers per year. That's very fast for this ice. In the interior, the ice is flowing only at a few meters per year. This almost looks like a continental divide, you know, with water, except it's with ice. It's an ice divide. Uh, and so this is now focusing in on West Antarctica. Uh, and there's this region here of the Thwaites and Pine Island glaciers, these two glaciers, uh, where you have very fast moving ice. The observation, again, there's, there's been um, uh, meters, uh, tens of meters of, of ice loss, thick, thickness of the ice, lo of the, uh, ice shelf, uh, and acceleration of flow. Uh, so we'd like to model this and then make our models, you know, calibrate our models to existing data and make them predictive in, into the future. Now, what are the challenges? Well, first of all, the equations I'll show you in a minute have strong nonlinearities and complex rheology. Uh, they're highly ill-conditioned due to coefficients that can vary by nine orders of magnitude. The geometry is very complex, high aspect ratio, you can see here. So this is thousand, several thousand kilometers in extent. A typical thickness of the ice sheet is two kilometers on average. Uh, this is a section through East Antarctica. This is a section through the West. You can see most of East and so this is West. Sorry, this is West. And this is East. Most of West Antarctica. That's the section there. Is below sea level. Why? Well, the ice is so massive and the sediment so weak that the ice has depressed the sediment. And now you have the situation where you have a potential instability because you have a, a negative slope of the of the bed. Uh, so as the ice melts, 
and it retreats, you have, you know, the retreat is towards, you know, down the slope, and water can flow underneath the ice and lubricate the base of the ice, leading to faster flow. So there is water underneath the ice sheet. There are lakes under there. There's, there's melting due to friction and due to the geothermal heat flux. Um, okay, so you can see the complicated geometry, a uh, wide range of length scales. Uh, and ultimately, the biggest challenge is the uncertainty in a number of uh, these parameters. First of all, the basal boundary conditions, the boundary conditions at the base of the ice. The ice is frozen in some regions, so there's a no-slip boundary condition, velocity is zero. In other regions, the, the ice is flowing freely. It's sliding freely on the, the basement. Um, and this is because of the lubrication, because of the, the, the water underneath. In most places, it's somewhere in between. There's some resistance to sliding, but we don't know how much that is. And in order to solve the forward problem, we have to know what this boundary condition is. So this is the largest uncertainty. That's why it's in red. And this is what we're going to invert for. But the topography, the basal topography, uh, this is illuminated by ground penetrating radar. So that's where we get our models from. But there is uncertainty associated with it. Uh, and definitely, there are smaller canyons that are not resolved by the radar. And we have inverted for this in the past. Uh, but the results I'm showing you today at the full Antarctic scale don't include inversions for basal topography. Similarly, there is some uncertainty in the rheology. Of course, you can go take ice, you can go to the laboratory, you can test it, and you can infer what the rheological properties are. But that's laboratory ice. Field ice is different. It has impurities. Uh, and in particular, when you do radar you know, images through the thickness of the ice, you can see layers which correspond to uh, uh, volcanic eruptions um, you know, over history. Uh, and other kinds of impurities. Uh, and so we have also inverted for the rheological co uh, coefficient. Um, and, but, that's, but we're freezing it here to the known laboratory value. And also, finally, the geothermal heat flux. One could in invert for that. And in other contexts, we have inverted for the geothermal heat flux. Uh, and, and that is, you know, again, a field at the base of the ice. So these are all fields. Uh, every one of these, either rheology parameter can be considered a field if you, if you think of the ice as being heterogeneous. So this leads to very high dimensional, after discretization, high dimensional parameters that have to be inferred from the data. OK, what about the data? Well, there is a, fortunately a diverse observational data. There is interferometric synthetic aperture radar, which gives us the velocity on the surface. That's an image here. In fact, that's what the animation that you saw, the graphic video that you saw. This is from INSAR. Altimetry gives us the height of the ice sheet. The GRACE satellite tells us about changes in mass. Uh, there is ground penetrating radar, which, as I said, uh, illuminates the, the base. Um, and critically, ice cores, uh, which are very few and far between in Antarctica, but those can tell us something about the temperature distribution. All right, so here are the governing equations. These look very familiar to anyone who does fluid dynamics, uh, conservation or balance of momentum, mass, and energy, except this is missing the advection term in the Navier-Stokes equation. Uh, because the Reynolds number is negligible for these kinds of flows of creeping flow, viscous effects dominate. But we, we still pay a price in complexity because this eta, which is the effective viscosity, has a very complicated form. It's a non-Newtonian fluid. It depends on temperature. It depends also on the, on the strain rate. Uh, so the dependence, so here's, here's the strain rate tensor. So it depends on the second invariant of the strain rate tensor. And this is the power. So n typically is the parameter that is, is used. n equals 3 is typical for, for ice. So that means you have a negative exponent. So what's happening is the ice is weakening under shear. So if you shear the ice, the crystals align with the direction of the flow. The effective viscosity drops. Merrick is now smiling because blood flow has a similar sort of behavior. But there it's the cells that, that align, right? Um, so it's a shear thinning fluid. And there's also this te temperature dependence through uh, an arrhenius uh, relationship. OK, so theta is the temperature. You, as you probably noticed, use the velocity. P is pressure. OK, and then finally, there's an energy equation. Now, what about the, uh, oops, what about the boundary conditions? Um, the, uh, so temperature and uh, temperature fixed on the surface and it's a traction-free surface. That's fine. The uh, basal boundary condition is this one. Uh, so down at the base of the ice sheet, uh, so T is the tangential operator here. So it simp simply says that the tangential component of traction is balanced by the tangential component of velocity. 
So the two point in the same direction. And the coefficient beta, this is the unknown. This is what we're going to invert for. When beta is infinite, it means the velocity is zero. So that's the no slip boundary condition. When beta is zero, that's the traction free boundary condition. So the free slip boundary condition. And beta can be anywhere between zero and infinity. Well, in practice, it varies between you know, negligible and 10 to the ninth. OK, so we're going to be inverting for beta, but it's a field. Every, every point on the surface, on the basal surface of the ice, <laughs> we're going to invert for. Uh, then um, we have the, uh, actually, unfortunately, we have this um, complexity due to temp the ice being either at the melting point or below it. So the ice is either you know, at or below the melting point. If it's at the melting point, uh, then, uh, of course, this is 0. So we have M. And what is M? M is a heat flux due to melting. So this is the, flux, the thermal flux boundary condition at the base, which is composed of the geothermal heat flux, any uh, heat uh, that comes from melting, and then finally a frictional heating due to the sliding of the ice. And that's, that's this beta is the same as this beta. All right? And then we, it's a complementarity condition so that when ice is not, when it's below the freezing uh, point, the melting point, um, then, uh, then, this, then M is zero and there's no contribution uh, from, there's no heat flux due to melting. All right, so we're going to invert for the, the beta. Uh, I'm not going to talk about these complementarity conditions. That means essentially we have a, an inverse problem with a forward problem that has these complementarity conditions. Things get very complicated. We have done work on that. We've done inversions, but not at the full Antarctic scale. So what you're going to see is just uh, this part. Um, and the u dot n is 0. So no normal flow and the boundary condition varying anywhere from no slip to free slip. OK, um, so let me say a little bit about the forward problem. Uh, the, I won't say too much about this, so I can talk more about the inverse problem. Uh, but we have discretization. That's, uh, it's a velocity discontinuous pressure. The reason for the discontinuous pressure is to maintain mass conservation, which is important for these non-Newtonian flow problems. Um, and this is arbitrarily high order. The sweet spot for us tends to be you know, the, the pair of 3, 1. Um, we use this PFORST library some of you have heard of. For, uh, uh, it's a force of octree parallel AMR, adaptive mesh refinement. Uh, the solver uh, uses a smooth agglomeration algebraic multigrid uh, that can handle these, these heterogeneities. Uh, we have to design specific smoothers because of the high aspect ratio. Uh, so, these, uh, so these smoothers um, essentially can, can um, you know, essentially are block uh, smoothers uh, that are based on decompositions into vertical blocks. Uh, and finally, a least squares commutator um, pre uh, approximation of the sure complement. Uh, okay, you can find out more about this. Um, it scales well uh, with, with mesh re refinement, increasing key order and number of cores. Uh, here's something that shows you adaptivity. Here's a coarse mesh that just describes the geometry and an adapted mesh that now resolves these regions where the ice flow is changing rapidly due to these ice streams. And you can see here an, ad adapt an adapted mesh to the region where the ice departs from land and floats on the water. So this is um, known as the grounding point. Uh, and there's a change in the boundary condition there. Uh, and so one needs um, you know, higher resolution at that boundary. Uh, grounding point. We, you know, we use octrees, uh, and so you know, we have the usual hanging nodes, uh, which can be handled um, as usual. Uh, and uh, this is a little bit about P-forest. Uh, so it uses a forest of octrees, meaning you decompose your domain into multiple subdomains that are mappable to unit cubes. You put an octree on each one. You refine the octree to adapt the mesh. You have a single space filling curve that runs through all of these octrees. And you partition uh, the mesh according to this space filling curve. Space filling curve is very fast and scalable to do in parallel. And they form, it forms the basis for partitioning the mesh and balancing the mesh. And by balance, we don't mean load balance. Uh, what we mean is maintaining this 2 to 1. Uh, do I have it anywhere here? No, I don't. But it's a 2 to 1 condition. So we, the refinement, we, we support a maximum of 2 to 1 ratio in refinement. It doesn't have to be that way, but we chose to do it that way. Um, and this thing says a little bit about performance. Uh, scaling from 12 cores to 220,000 cores. Ideal would be flat. These are the two most expensive parts uh, of, the, of the adaptivity. 
It's the balancing the mesh, maintaining that two to one ratio after you've subdivided everything, and actually bookkeeping, keeping track of all the nodes. The, these are the parts that take up the most. This is the cost um, at, at any set of cores. It's dominated by these two functions. Uh, there's um, the, the actual uh, partitioning in purple here is a small part of the whole thing. That scales really well. But the whole thing, you know, from 12 cores to a factor of what, 2,000 increase is essentially constant. Uh, and this is just the AMR. This doesn't include the solver, the, the PDE solver. Once you throw the PDE solver, you don't see the, any, anything. This is in the wash. But just the AMR by itself, this is just the, you know, refinement, coarsening, uh, repartitioning, rebalancing, and bookkeeping. All of these things scale very well. Okay, so of course the flip side is we have to use hexahedra, you know, which are limiting in some cases compared to tetrahedra. Uh, and then finally, this is a little bit on um, the application of this. Uh, this is not the ice sheet. This is something else, mantle convection. But the equations are the same, remarkably. You know, the the rheology is the same. The, even the power n equals three is the same as ice. Uh, the difference, of course, is the geometries are different. The boundary conditions are different. Um, and the, the, the variability in the strain and the effective uh, viscosity is different. Um, so this was a um, calculation uh, on the blue gene Q at Lawrence Livermore that was scaled to the full machine, nearly 1.6 million cores, so actually uh, 3.2 million threads. Uh, and the solver scales you know, nearly ideally. This is, so this is the implicit solver. Krylov to solve that saddle point system with a sure complement type precondition. A sure complement is built from this, um, this, this idea of um, B, what can we call the BFBT algorithm uh, and a algebraic multigrid approximation of the Poisson solve that happens inside the, the BFT uh, approximation of the sure complement and another algebraic multigrid that hits the 1 1 block, which is the viscosity uh, block. Uh, and it's actually more when I say. Uh, algebraic multigrid. It's actually a P version multigrid. So there's coarsening in P first, and then there's coarsening in H. Since everything comes from an adapted mesh, uh, there is, you know, there's a hierarchy. And in, in, even though it's not structured mesh, there is a tree. And so you coarsen in P first. When you get down to the lowest order, then you coarsen in H. And finally, your coarse grid solver is algebraic multigrid. Um, and, uh, and even algebraic multigrid has a direct solve as its coarse grid solve. Uh, okay, that's that's a very high level description. You can see more in this paper over here. But you know, essentially this implicit solver for a problem with 10 to the 10th variation in coefficient um, in, in the effective viscosity, uh, saddle point, indefinite, highly nonlinear, um, can be solved you know, in, with 97% parallel efficiency on 1.6 million cores. OK, back to uh, the ice sheet problem and the inverse problem. So uh, let's talk a little bit about uh, the inverse problem. So this is a cartoon taken from Tarantola's book. I, I like it because it sort of distinguishes the different components of the expression for the posterior. So we have three ingredients that enter into the definition of the inverse problem. There is the prior. So imagine we have a single model parameter and a single observable D. Okay? Um, and the, we associate a prior to the model parameters. This tells us that any kind of prior knowledge we have could be uniform if we don't know anything. But so we have prior knowledge of the parameter. In this case, is large variance. So we're, we're relatively uncertain about the, the parameter, with some mean and some variance. It doesn't have to be Gaussian, but these expressions are this expression is based on Gaussian. These are not these. Actually, no, these are based on Gaussian too. Okay. Uh, there's the observa There's the observables here. So we have an actual observation with some uncertainty associated with that. Okay. And these are the, these first two rows are simply descriptions of, of these two. And then uh, the last ingredient is the PDF that relates the model parameters to the output observables through the solution of the forward model. Okay? So the nonlinear Stokes equations, uh, given model parameters M, the basal boundary conditions, uh, the map from these conditions into the output observables. Yeah, there's a question. Oh, um, probably density function. Probably density function, yeah. Not portable document format. but. Um, sorry about that. Yeah, so uh, just a probably distribution, yeah, um, for continuous parameters. Um, and uh, the, uh, so these, the, these furnish, uh, so these three ingredients, so the map from the model parameters to the output observables, this would be a line if it were a deterministic forward model, 
but uh, the Bayesian framework accommodates stochastic forward models. You know, for a given parameter m, you can see there's a range of outputs, right? There's a distribution of outputs. Uh, and you can, you know, that's, that, that fits into the framework of Bayesian inference. It's not so easy to come up with a stochastic model itself. In other words, a model that represents uncertainty in the, in, in the, in the model structure itself. Right? The uncertainty we have now is in the parameters we're trying to infer from the data, uh, not in the model structure. We assume that the, the governing equations are reasonable representation of reality. And this model, the full Stokes equations with full three-dimensionality, no assumptions, the full nonlinear rheology is actually the highest of a hierarchy of models which gets simpler and simpler. Uh, so we felt it wasn't necessarily to represent the model uncertainty. Okay? So, um, so these are the three ingredients and the posterior distribution is a conjunction of these states of probability. So this is the product of these, you get this. Uh, and finally, what we care about is just the, the we care about the distribution of the parameters. So we integrate out over data space, that's over here, and this integral over data space gives us this expression, which, so we say the posterior distribution, so a Bayesian would regard this as the solution of the inverse problem. Not a single number, but a distribution in the model parameter reflecting the uncertainty uh, in making the inference on the parameter from the data, which itself is based on uncertainty in the obs observations and prior knowledge and possible uncertainty in the model. All right, so this is the solution of the inverse problem. In the case when you have a, uh, a prior that is Gaussian, as in this case, and often we, we choose to, to make the prior Gaussian, and when the noise is additive, um, as, uh, as, uh, as we have in this case, then the posterior takes this form, which you saw on an earlier slide. Okay, um, now, uh, the, uh, what can we do? So if, you know, this is a one-dimensional distribution, uh, I can plot it, I can compute a mean, I can compute moments, that's fine. In one dimension, I can do anything I want. In high dimensions, we're out of luck, because now m is million-dimensional, let's say, and f of m means go off and solve the nonlinear Stokes equations, which, you know, for us, I mean, the very highly efficient tuned code takes five minutes on 4,000 cores, okay? So if we're in a million dimensions, we can't afford to sample. I mean, certainly to do the, we're not going to integrate in, in a million dimensions to get the mean, but if we use Monte Carlo to, to do that integral, there's no way we can take the millions of samples that are required. Again, each one requiring a forward solve. All right, so the first thing you can do is you can say, all right, suppose I linearize the parameter to observable map, f of m. Suppose I linearize it about uh, the map point. So the map point is the point of maximum posterior distribution, this point here. I can find it by maximizing uh, the posterior or minimizing the negative log posterior. So this is what we're doing here. We're minimizing the negative log posterior. This looks like our deterministic inverse problems. So we have fast algorithms to do this. So we linearize about, about the solution of this optimization problem. You have to solve it first, right? And then we linearize. And then it turns out that the posterior is, in fact, Gaussian with a mean given by this map point, solution of the optimization problem, and a posterior covariance given by nothing but the inverse of the Hessian evaluated at the, at the map point. So going back to this picture, it's essentially making a Gaussian approximation there. And the curvature here is the inverse of that dictates the uncertainty in the parameters through the covariance matrix or covariance operator. Okay, um, now, easier said than done. Of course, this is the first approximation. I'll talk about what we do later on um, if this is not a good approximation. For example, if you really had a situation like this, a multimodal posterior, uh, then, then it wouldn't be sufficient just to approximate this solution. We tend not to believe multimodal posteriors. Uh, there's only one Earth. You know, so, um, but uh, the, so, and we typically design priors that try to eliminate them. We think of them as artifacts of the uh, data or lack of data. Uh, but if we don't eliminate them, then you have to do something special to take care of it. I won't talk about that here. Uh, but this is a useful approximation in and of itself and also as a way to accelerate Markov chain Monte Carlo sampling. Uh, so, um, again, inverse of the Hessian is the posterior. Well, fine, but. You know, how do you compute the inverse of the Hessian? I, in fact, I don't even, the Hessian has a component that comes, this is the Hessian of the, the, um, the data missed it, this whole thing, and this is the Hessian of the prior term. This is a quadratic, so that's easy, you can see. Uh, but I cannot construct this Hessian. Every column of the Hessian amounts to 
a pair of linearized forward and adjoint solves. So that's out of the question. To solve a pair of Stokes equations a million times just to get the Hessian and then invert it, can't do it. Um, but, so I'm skipping a, a couple of slides here on the infinite dimensional. So all of this, everything I've said was explained in finite dimensions, but it goes through in infinite dimensions. As long as one is careful about how you define the prior, it has to be defined in a certain way with sufficient smoothness that, to guarantee uh, a well-defined posterior. I won't talk about that, but you can, you can refer to Andrew Stewart's um, paper in Acton America, which lays out a foundation for doing this, for, for doing infinite dimensional uh, Bayes and inverse problems. And you have to be careful about how you discretize. So there are a number of things that one has to be careful about in order to guarantee that as the mesh is refined, the posterior on a given mesh uh, converges to the true infinite dimensional posterior. OK, so I'm going to skip that. But let's go to this issue. So we're back to finite dimensions. So how do we deal with uh, this uh, Hessian? Uh, and the idea is to recognize that it comes from two pieces. One is the Hessian of the data misfit, and the other is the Hessian of the prior. And the Hessian of the data misfit is, in fact, a compact operator in many cases. In other words, it has eigenvalues that decay to 0. Often they decay rapidly to 0. So that suggests that we make a low rank approximation. Okay, so here's the idea. We, first of all, we precondition by the prior. So we, we take the square root of the prior. Actually, it turns out you can organize the calculations to not have to do the square root, just like in CG, when you precondition by CG, you don't have to, do, to, um, to take the square root of the operator and apply it to both sides. So we pull out the square root of the prior, and what you see here is the identity, and then this. This is the prior precondition data misfit Hessian, and uh, this has the advantage that the eigenvalues decay but the inverse of a differential operator, so we take the prior actually to be a differential operator, the inverse of that is also compact. So this is the composition of two compact operators. So the eigenvalues collapse even faster. So that's nice. We can make a low rank approximation. And then we can truncate the eigenvalues when they're small relative to 1. Right? Now we have something objective to compare to. Compare to 1. If they're small, we truncate. And we say, that's it. That's all the information that's coming from the data filtered through the prior. The rest of the eigenvalues, th that is information that the data is telling us about the model parameters, but the data doesn't tell us anything, so it, it's just pure prior. We don't need the PDE model. We don't need the 4,000 cores running for, for five minutes to solve a single ice sheet uh, model. OK, so this is the idea. Um, the, uh, the eigenvalues decay rapidly. Uh, they decay rapidly because we have a limited number of observations, first of all. Uh, and we have a parameter to observable map that's smoothing. Information is lost. When you go from the boundary condition at the base of the ice up to the surface flow of velocity, one loses information. So many problems have this, 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 um, this property. Certain problems, problems that are advection dominated uh, or wave wa equations, may not have this low rank property. The eigenvalues may, they still decay, but they don't decay fat rapidly enough. And you can't make a low rank approximation. If I have time, I'll mention what we do uh, at, the, at the end of the talk. All right, so how, still, we don't, how do I, you know, how do I get the spectrum? So I want to truncate the eigenvalues. I, I can't even form this. How can I get the eigenvalues? Uh, well, what we appeal to is, um, is randomized SVD, okay? Uh, so randomized SVD is a very nice algorithm. I'll talk about it in the next slide. But basically, we can only form actions of this, this, uh, this operator here, the prior precondition data misinhesion. We can form actions of this with vectors. So a, a Hessian vector product amounts to a linearized forward, linearized adjoint. So there's the forward, and there's the adjoint solved. And, uh, and randomized SVD requires only matrix vector products, just like any Krylov method, right? You never need to form the matrix itself. You just need to form the action on a vector, all right? And we do that at the cost of two linear uh, solves. The important thing is we can't do it very often. We certainly can't do it a million times. So can we get away with a small number? And it turns out, yes, there's the randomized SVD algorithm. The details of the algorithm don't matter. The important thing is that we hit H with random vectors. And we only need enough random vectors equivalent to the numerical rank. So the problems I'll show you have a million degrees of freedom. The, the base of the ice sheet is parameterized in a million degrees of freedom. But typically, only a few thousand modes in the parameter space are informed by the, the, the data. So we have to do matrix vector products order thou a few thousand times. That's the important thing. Um, you can read about this in, um, uh, well, here it is, uh, in the SIAM review. Uh, there's a nice review paper on randomized SVD. But the basic idea with randomized SVD, it gives you a low rank approximation 
uh, that is within a constant factor of optimal. Deterministic SVD is optimal. The error that you commit is equivalent to the eigenvalues that you, that you discard, okay, the remaining eigenvalues. Um, the randomized SVD, it's within a constant factor of the neglected eigenvalues where you truncate. And this, this constant can be made arbitrarily small. Uh, R is fixed, that's the numerical rank. But if we oversample, so rather than taking R vectors, if we oversample by P, P doesn't have to be too large. P can be 10 or 20. And that brings this constant down to 5 or 10, so within a small constant of optimal. OK. Um, so back to uh, the algorithm. So we make a low rank approximation of this using randomized SVG, using only matrix vector products. Each matrix vector product is a linearized forward adjoint solve. So that gives us this low rank spectral decomposition. And then I invert this easily using Sherman Morrison, Woodbury. And that gives me an expression. I can even write down the, or the error. And you can see the error decays when the eigenvalues are small relative to 1. Then this is small. So that's, my, that's what I choose to truncate. In practice, 0.1. You just choose 0.1. And then finally, you get this expression for the, uh, po the, the posterior. So the posterior is the prior minus information learned from the data. And this is low rank. Okay? So the data inform our directions and parameter space. The million dimensions, you know, uh, one million minus a few thousand of them are dictated by the prior. And the data is only telling you about these limited numbers. So this is where the PDE solves, the forward, the Stoke, nonlinear Stokes goes on. Okay. Um, there's some papers that, that show optimality of this uh, in, with respect to different measures uh, of what makes a low rank approximation um, optimal. And again, just to show you the posterior is the, re is the prior covariance less information learned from the data because this is representing uncertainty in the solution, right? So as we learn more information, we reduce the uncertainty. Here's a plot, three separate meshes from 40,000 to 400 something thousand parameters and the, the spectra lie on top of each other. So what you're seeing here is the eigenvalue, the first 700 eigenvalues of this prior preconditioned data misfit Hessian, just to convince you that it is in fact um, a approximatable by low rank. But more important than the low rank is that it's mesh independent. I refine the mesh and you know, once I get to a sufficient resolution, the data can, are not going to tell me anything more. So I refine the mesh, doesn't matter, it's mesh independent, the eigenvalues collapse, here, the first 700 eigenvectors out of 400,000 are sufficient to represent the information contained in the data about the model parameters. OK, um, so this, is, this was to show you some analysis of a simple model problem that one can derive expressions, uh, the eigenvalues. In one case, this is an inversion for the coefficient of a Poisson equation. Uh, one can show the eigenvalues decay like 1 over i squared. You can actually work something out even when you have pointwise observations. So 1 over i squared, some problems we see 1 over i cubed. Some, but you know, you can prove things on very simple problems. Uh, more generally, for something complex like this, we just observe numerically. OK, uh, now, that's the so-called Laplace approximation. That is the approximation of the posterior at the map point as a Gaussian, where the, where, the, where the covariance of the Gaussian is the inverse of the Hessian. What happens if you have a general distribution that you want to sample? So the idea is you use the Markov chain Monte Carlo method. Um, and Markov chain Monte Carlo, uh, you're going to replace the distribution with samples and then compute you know, sample statistics, such as the mean, uh, with these sample points. So how does the algorithm generate these samples? You know, again, you want to sample from a distribution. Uh, and we don't know how to draw samples from that distribution, unlike, say, forward Monte Carlo um, propagation. So we need an algorithm. And what we do is we come up with a proposal density. Think of it as a preconditioner. What's a good preconditioner? Something that, that approximates the operator but is easy to invert. Here, the proposal density should approximate the true density, but it should be easy to draw samples from. Often, one takes a Gaussian here. And what you do is you compute this ratio. So you, you, you draw a sample from this proposal, and you calculate the probability of the proposed point divided by the probability of the, of the current point. There's this other term here. I, I won't talk about it for now. Let's just assume it's a symmetric proposal density. So if I reverse uh, the current point and the proposed point, you get the same probability. So then this basically says that if the move is proposed uphill, to higher probability, you accept it, you move uphill. If it's downhill, if the proposed point has a lower probability, you don't throw it away. You still accept it with some probability. So you roll the dice. And um, depending on how low a probability it is, okay, then you, um, 
you, uh, you, you accept or reject. Okay, so this is what a vanilla random walk, uh, what's known as a random walk method does. It's a, it's, a, it's a MCMC method that uses an isotropic proposal density. Suppose we're trying to sample from the, um, the gray contours over here, uh, then we draw a sample from these blue uh, circles, and, and you can see th these blue circles are irrelevant to the, the gray contours of the true density. So the proposal here is a poor predictor of how the actual density behaves. In high dimensions, this makes a big difference. Uh, instead, what we do is we use everything I just talked about. So this whole Gaussian construction with the inverse of the Hessian as the covariance, that's what this is. So we, at, the, at the sample point, we build up a, Ga a Gaussian. We use the inverse of the Hessian as a covariance. So to two derivatives, the blue contours and the gray contours match right around here. And we draw a sample from the blue one. Now, it's going to be poor out here if you really have such a highly nonlinear posterior. Um, but at least, you know, in a large region, it should be OK. Uh, and what one does is uh, you draw a sample from this and, and use it for the Markov chain Monte Carlo. There's more sophisticated versions of this where we freeze uh, the proposal density. And this is actually contained in a library that we're distributing called HippyLib. I can talk about that later if people are interested. Um, and um, let, me, let me jump to the results. Uh, so um, I was going to show you the adjoint and the Hessian expressions, um, but that's, if you know variational calculus, you know how to do this. Uh, and if you don't, probably two slides aren't, aren't, aren't enough. But here, I think everyone knows variational calculus here. Uh, so what I'm going to go through, there's some, I had some synthetic inversions, but let's just go directly to the real data. This is from a data set that comes from uh, passes of, of satellites over a two-year period, 900 satellite tracks with 3,000 orbits. And what um, this database contains is surface velocity. Okay? So you can see here varying from four kilometers per year down to basically a meter per year. Uh, and we t this is the surface velocity we invert for the boundary condition at the base. So this is this beta parameter at the base of the ice sheet. The red colors represent it's close to zero. So um, these represent no resistance. Remember, that's the, 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 the free slip boundary conditions. That re represents no resistance to sliding. The blue represents essentially a no slip condition. This is actually a cube root of beta. So beta is 10 to the ninth. This is 10 to the 1. So there's nine orders of magnitude variation just in beta itself. And what we find surprisingly is the large regions of little resistance to sliding near the coast, but actually extending deep into the interior. So we expected near the coast because the ice sheet, the streams are moving rapidly there, but not so expected deep in the interior. Of course, the question then is, what sort of confidence do you have in this? So then you go to the Bayesian formulation. Um, and this is just showing the observed velocity, and this is the reconstructed velocity. So you can see it does pretty well um, between these two. And you see there are differences between the dark blue and the light blue, but remember the dark blue is one meter per year, and the light blue is 10 meters per year. Uh, so, and that's largely in the interior. So near these critical, fast-flowing ice streams where there's instability that is being observed and increases in flow and thinning of the ice, um, here we actually are able to match the data uh, quite well. You see that if you, keep, if you look at the, at the red. OK, but what about the uncertainty in the inversion? This is the, these are the errors in the observation from which you can build a noise covariance. Um, and uh, so, so this is an idea of the Bayesian solution. You have samples of the prior. There's no specific information contained in the prior other than smoothness. These are samples of the posterior here. Uh, and you can see there is large variability, larger variability in the interior, but less variability uh, near the coast. In fact, that we can flip through those. So the left is the mean, the right is a sample. And you can see between the different samples from slide to slide, the, what's changing mostly is the interiors. Large uncertainty in the interior, less uncertainty near the coast. And uh, this is a plot of the diagonal of the covariance operator, so the variance field. Uh, actually, the square root of the variance is it's the prior, uh, the standard deviation. And so this is the prior, and this is the posterior. So information we learned, the colors don't change too much in the interiors. We haven't learned much about the interior, but we've learned a lot about the flowing ice near the coast. And the last thing I'm going to show you is, OK, so this is the, the mean. And now I want to show you um, the, the, this thing we've been talking about, the spectrum of the Hessian. Uh, so this shows two meshes. What you saw earlier was a different problem. This one is for the actual, the full Antarctica. 
So this is a 400,000 parameter mesh. When I say parameter, I mean the base of the ice sheet is discretized with 400,000 parameters. And then 1.2 million parameters. The, the, the eigenvalue decay, again, this is the prior precondition uh, Hessian of the data misfit. The curves lie on top of each other, which tells you that the data, even though the data are everywhere on the top surface, right? This is a satellite image. The data actually comes in a much finer resolution than we use in the mesh. The mesh has kilometer resolution, maybe 500 meters in a few places, mostly kilometer to a few kilometer resolution, um, but the, the data on our finer grid. So this tells you that as you refine the mesh and you refine the data, what's happening is the information content doesn't change. The, the data are just as informative. We can truncate it about 4,000, 5,000, maybe 5,000 eigenvectors, and here are the eigenvectors. Here's the first eigenvector. So what lights up are regions over here. It's very smooth. Um, second eigenvector. Third, it goes now to East Antarctica, back to West Antarctica. You're seeing like higher modes. Imagine the mode shapes of a drum, but this is a drum that has variable thickness, effectively. Right? Um, and so these are highly localized, but smooth. And as you get into higher eigenvectors, 9, 10, I'll show you all 5,000 eigenvectors. <laughs> no, I won't. Uh, so this is 100. Um, you see the length scales are getting smaller. Still very little action in the interior, 200, 500, 1,000, 2,000. Now it's starting to touch in the interior. Uh, and finally, the last eigenvector we trusted before we truncated because it was small relative to 1. So this is giving you a sense of the length scales that you have a right to infer from the data. The data informant of about these as the finest length scales. Beyond this, it's just all prior. It's all prior information. And the prior, in our case, is not informative other than fixing a correlation length. Uh, this is effectively a smoothing prior at the finest scales. OK, so in summary, um, what, uh, the, these regularized inversions uh, show um, essentially a weakness at the base of the ice sheet. There's little resistance to sliding that if you had a warming, significant warming of the ocean, and you had a collapse of the ice, uh, ice shelves that are buttressing some of this flow, that there is essentially no resistance at the base of the ice to resist rapid uh, acceleration of the flow of, of ice into the ocean. I mean, that's, that's you know, a scenario. Um, obviously, one would need much more data and bring in you know, other kinds of data, such as um, the laser altimetry and topography, not just to invert, not, not just to fix in the model, but to invert for. Use them as prior information and invert for all these other things, too. So uh, we need to quantify the uncertainty in these inversions before you can draw a conclusion like the one above. Um, the, the Laplace approximation, this Gaussianized based on a linearized parameter observable map, uh, this one um, has, supports the idea that we have relatively high confidence on the, in the reconstruction of the basal parameter near the coast, relatively low confidence in the interior. There was, a, there was two orders of magnitude difference in the standard deviation between the interior and out near the coast. Um, but the key is that you need the inverse of the Hessian, and you can't even construct a Hessian explicitly. But the idea is you use a low rank approximation of the Hessian constructed by hitting the Hessian with random vectors and teasing out the dominant eigenvalues. That's the randomized SVT algorithm. Uh, and the cost of everything I've shown you measured in terms of forward adjoint PDE solves, because that's the currency. That's, what we, that's the price um, that we pay. So that cost is independent of the parameter dimension. <coughs> Uh, the, and the data dimension, well, and the, st the state dimension shouldn't matter anyway. Um, and, uh, but given all of this, still we had to solve 120,000 linearized forward adjoint Stokes solves to go to the map point, to solve the inverse problem, to find the map point, and then to construct the Gaussian approximation at the map point. So clearly this Gaussian approximation cannot be used to sample, as I said, that earlier algorithm, every point. We're not going to use it to sample. Instead, our current library, we build the Hessian approximation at the map point and use that to sample everywhere. But again, we can talk about that afterwards. Thank you very much for your attention, and I'll just leave some acknowledgments here. Thank you again. Welcome. Wow. Before we continue with the questions, we have a gift. Okay. Um, so I've heard you've been to Aachen before. Ah. And this is a box of Printen. They are typical Aachen cookies. So cookies. chances are you already know them. Chances um, are they won't make it back home. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, this is a uh, Avatar Aachen University. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you.
So, mm -hmm. um, other questions? There's a microphone here if anyone wants to ask. There's a button on the back. Have to hold it. There it is. Yeah. Thank you. So given the forward problem is uh, so important that we need to solve so many times that I would just be interested, I mean we were talking about shadow drum models before, right? So with that kind of 3D model, and I'm not just talking about the forward one, you could get a sense of how, to which extent we actually deviate from a hydrostatic uh, and to which extent is the velocity shear profile actually important? So do you, could you give us some, some sense of that? Yeah, I mean, I think the, uh, the current thinking is that the, um, the 3D models are most important, you know, in the fast-flowing ice streams uh, near the coast. Um, and then the idea that people want to build multi-model approximations where you have like a shallow ice model in the interior, and then you couple it with, with uh, such a, th a 3D Stokes. You know, maybe 3D Stokes with hydrostatic, you know, or the full-blown, what what's called the full Stokes equations. Um, our, our philosophy is we can get away with a coarser mesh in the interior. Maybe there's not so much to be gained, but certainly, uh, you know, I mean, it's a 2D problem. It's much easier, uh, and even the hydrostatic problem is no longer a saddle point problem, right? Because, you know, you're, you're solving just for the velocity. Uh, so that's probably, ultimately, that is the, be the most elegant thing to do: to have different models in different regions and to patch them up. Um, but short of that, then one can do sort of similar to I think what you were gonna we, we didn't get into it but to do Bayesian model selection uh, and to then do the inverse problem and see how well are the data explained by the shallow ice approximation. Um, I think for Antarctica, you know, people aren't trying to use, you know, just the shallow ice by itself. They're trying to uh, do some kind of hydrostatic stokes. There have been some inversions at the Antarctic scale using the um, a hydrostatic approximation, one of the, the several models. Okay, um, so let me, cl let me clarify that. Uh, we initially were very ambitious. We wanted to have adaptive mesh refinement uh, that was solution driven, solution adaptive. Uh, so during the solution itself, the mesh would adapt, you know, and then of course that would change the parameterization of the parameters. So from each, you know, MCMC iteration to the next, you have a different, you know, set of parameters. I mean, this, this can be handled, the reversible jump MCMC, there are techniques that, where one can have. But it gets really complicated. In the end, we decided that, okay, we sort of know where the action is. We know at the grounding line we need to find mesh. We know that you know, the, 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 the coast has a very complex geometry. So just in resolving the coast, you can see you have a pretty fine mesh there. And so in the end, we ended up having a static mesh. I mean, it was adapted, but upfront to the, the coastal regions, to the grounding lines, uh, and to anywhere where we thought we, ha we would have fast flowing ice, which you can get from the surface velocity, and then we fixed it. Um, more generally, one could do adaptivity, but um, it's not clear what the error indicator should be. For a forward problem, it's clear what it is. You, you, know, you want to reduce discretization error. But an inverse problem, discretization error is actually a small component of the overall error. The biggest error is the you know, is the error you make in, in the fact the problem is ill-posed and you cannot infer the parameters. So if you have too fine a mesh, if you try to reduce the discretization error by refining the mesh, what ends up happening is you have too many degrees of freedom there that are not determined by the data. And so you end up with greater ill-posedness, which if you didn't do anything would mean you'd have infinite variance in those directions because the data, data don't tell you anything. On the other hand, you don't want too coarse of a mesh because, you know, as you saw in these inversions, there are regions where there are small length scales um, you know, the, uh, let's say, in here, this one is the observations, this is the reconstruction. And so there are sharp boundaries where the ice is changing from kilometers per year to meters per year. And so you do want to find mesh there. 
so the mesh can't be too coarse because you won't pick that up. It can't be too fine. The, the definition of error indicators uh, uh, is, is still kind of an open question. There's some heuristic ideas, but it's not clear how to do that exactly. Yeah. But we'd like to do it. There's one, two. Okay. Yeah. Uh, so the uh, let's see. Uh, yeah, I mean, I don't really have much on 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 this, but I'll just put this up anyway. Um, the uh, so the 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 discretization and the solver uh, were home cooked. Um, PForce has been open source. The ice flow code has not been, um, you know, Toby, I'm sure, is happy to share it with people. The problem is it's not very well documented, so it's going to be kind of a nightmare to, to work out. Um, instead, essentially, the underlying components are, in, are being integrated into Petsy. So Toby did a postdoc with the Petsy group after he finished, before he went to Georgia Tech. Uh, and the, um, the uh, in particular, this sort of two-and-a-half-dimensional preconditioner is built into Petsy uh, for anyone who wants to do preconditioning of these highly anisotropic geometry, high aspect ratio geometries. Um, so that preconditioner is available. Um, and uh, the discretization uh, in Petsy, um, I think this, this mass conservative, th th these, uh, these things are also being integrated in. PForce is being integrated in. The ice sheet code as a package, yeah, I'm free, free to, happy to share it, but we, we don't have the resources to spend an extra two years to bring it up to, to a usable um, and you know, well-documented um, yeah. status. Yeah, yeah. Oh, and finally, I mentioned, I just, I'll put another plug. All of the inversion stuff, that is open source. Uh, if you just Google hippie lib, hippie, L-I-B, one word, um, that's available, and that's, um, uh, it has all of these low-rank approximations, and the sampling that you saw, and uh, the you know the Markov chain Monte Carlo that's accelerated by Hessians, and I mean, all that business that's all there, uh, and it keeps expanding. You know, so that's under active development. Length scale? Length scale of the slip length that you must actually or are allowed to distinguish. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So how does this quantitatively compare with, with uh, let's say, the length scale given by a subject of legs under our right? So would you be able to pick them up in your signal? I mean, that, that's a good question. So let's just re review for a second where this comes from. Uh, and this is just simply a uh, truncation of, um, so when you, when you do the low rank approximation here and you invert, you know, you're getting a remainder term that depends, that looks like this. Uh, and so of course we're gonna use this piece, but this remainder term represents the error. So we choose when the eigenvalues are small relative to one. It's up to us to decide what's small. You know, we typically take 0 0.1, 0 0.2. Okay, so that's what the truncation is. And then how it, how it reflects, how we see it, is essentially in you know, the largest eigenvector. Let's, let's go, actually go back and look at the curve. So the, uh, so where we truncated, so we truncated uh, this problem, actually it looks like we truncated to 4,000. We could have kept these here. Um, but, uh, so this gives us a sense of uh, how far we can go. So you can see that the length, I mean, the length scales in the interior are actually quite large. I mean, actually what you want is a composite of all the eigenvectors. This is, we're just assuming the 4,000th 4, 4, eigenvector has all of the small scales in here. It may not, there may be some of the lower modes that might have some, you know, some, some finer scales. It just it may have happened that way. And these are eigenvectors of the Hessian, so they're not eigenvalues of the forward operator or anything. Eigenvalues of the Hessian. Okay. So, but let's assume this one, the smallest length scales are indicated here. Yeah. So an interesting question is, where are the subglacial lakes? Uh, and the answer is, I don't know. I mean, I I, I suspect 
that, um, that there is no correlation between them, um, or maybe there's a weak correlation in the following sense, that the regions where we appear to learn the most are the regions where the velocity gradient is largest on the surface, where the, where the tangential, where the velocity is changing most rapidly on the surface. So um, I if I perturb the boundary condition, um, then I get a signal on the surface. And when, when that signal itself is variable, then it appears from these results that that's where the information, that, that is where I can, I can dictate information at the base. In the interior, for example, where the ice is moving very slowly, uh, almost like a plug flow, meter per year, uh, then there's no information on what's happening at the base. Um, and so if you look at where the information, the small length scales are, they tend to be where the ice is flowing fastest. Uh, and, and not necessarily where the ice is flowing fastest, but at the margins where the ice is changing rapidly. Uh, in velocity. So if that's the case, then these regions are correlated with, uh, they're probably correlated. I mean, why is the ice moving fast? Well, it could be topography, but it also could be the boundary condition, which is the ice. So we haven't done the exercise of going back and trying to understand where, the, where they are. I don't know how many of them are mapped out, um, but you know, certainly some of the larger ones are known. And try to see where they are. That's actually a good question. Uh, you know, this was run over weeks. I mean, you grab computer time. I and mean, that's the beauty of Markov chain Monte Carlo. You know, you can just, you can, you know, draw these samples. Uh, actually, no, this, I'm sorry, this wasn't, yeah, no, no. The, the randomized SVD, let's see, I have statistics. Uh, uh, I, I just have some summary statistics over here. Um, but anyway, so the randomized SVD, no, oh, where is it? Um, the randomized SVD can be done uh, it's, it's in the final slide. There are 120,000, something like that. 120,000 Stokes salts um, here. So, um, you know, everything put together was about 120,000 Stokes salts, uh, but these were staged over weeks of computing time because um, the randomized SVD, which is a big part of this, is inverting the Hessian quote, inverting the Hessian, building the low rank approximation. So this is com completely asynchronous. Um, relative to say Langshos or something like this. This is, and this is why we like, ran one of the reasons why we like randomized SVD, you just hit it with random vectors. You can do 100 random vectors today, another 100 tomorrow, another 100 the next day. Uh, so 120,000 times each one runs five minutes on 4,000 cores. So um, let's, let's call it, um, geez, I don't know, maybe, maybe 300 core hours times 120,000. Uh, actually, the number I remember for this entire exercise was about 12, 12 million core hours. 12 million core hours on, uh, yeah. T 10 to 12, 10 to 12 million core hours. Yeah. So I'm finishing the question session now. Thank you very much for giving this talk. Thank you.